Thanks, Jackie. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I would like to call to order this special meeting of the uh, Law and Justice Committee of the Incarceration Prevention Reduction Task Force. Um, welcome all the uh, Stakeholder Advisory Committee members that are with us today. Uh, we're glad you're here, um, that you're taking the time to, to really dig in and, and get a, a feel of what the, the task force work is all about. So I'm not going to spend much time with you today. I'm just here to kind of answer any questions if they should come up along the way. I'll be here the whole meeting, but um, I'm going to turn it over to Raylene and Arlene, and they're going to lead us through. But again, thanks for being here and welcome. And thanks to the co-chairs for, uh, for putting this together. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Barry. This is a Legal and Justice Subcommittee co-chairs. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to share information as our committee has been working on to reduce incarceration over the years. Myself, um, Raylene Hutink King and Arlene Feld, you will see my name um, as Hutink and sometimes King. I just don't know who I am half the time, but um, my email comes as Hutink. I just wanted a disclaimer if anybody had questions or wasn't sure who to um, to have that out there. Also, I just came back from vacation, so I'm hoping that Stephen has generously opted to assist if I miss things or Arlene will, and um, the two of us should be able to guide you through some of the stuff that has been done through the Legal and Justice Subcommittee and what we plan on doing um, in the future. So some of the topics that we've been dealing with are domestic violence treatment services, pretrial processes, jail alternatives, lead, mental health and drug court re-entry, navigation, competency and restoration, and the impacts of COVID and some of the legislative impacts recently. Um, Arlene is going to touch more on re-entry and competency and, and jail navigation. And I'll touch on some of the other subjects um, with the help from others that have um, been involved. So last year, we started a focus on domestic violence offender treatment services as we've had um, treatment providers retire and not remain under state contract, um, not continue those services. So we have a shortage of domestic violence treatment providers. Um, that are certified by the state. Um, a lot of charges with domestic violence require treatment. So um, that's definitely an issue that we're concerned about, um, making sure that people have access to um, treatment. And so we wanna bring in more um, treatment providers. We also wanna make sure that the defendants that need this treatment um, are able to afford to do this. Um, mental health and substance abuse treatment is funded by insurance. Um, however, domestic violence isn't, and it's uh, a problem because it, it affects everybody, and um, it's not just poverty-stricken people, it's um, nationwide, worldwide, and a lot of individuals that have a domestic violence charge in one city end up with other charges and violations of no contact order, so we really want to work on trying to get more um, treatment providers. Whatcom County Probation, um, who provides probation for courts throughout the county with the exception of Ferndale um, and district court does have a domestic violence MRT program that is um, something that individuals can do. It's not under the state certification, but it does help with those that can't afford some of the state certified programs. Um, and the program does seem to be working well with those that have uh, decided to participate and follow through with that. And um, so that's some of that pretrial processes group. So there's pretrial supervision for courts of limited jurisdiction in which I mean district court, um, municipal courts that deal with gross misdemeanor and misdemeanor charges. Um, so if somebody has a DUI or a prior DUI, there might be pretrial requirements that are set by statute. Um, and then Whatcom County Probation also assists with those pretrial services. What didn't happen until um, recently was there wasn't a pretrial services program through Superior Court for felonies. Um, this was uh, frustration by some defendants, some attorneys saying, you know, there's programs for misdemeanors, there's not programs for felony, it doesn't seem right. Um, so there was a lot of concerns about that. A pretrial processes group was established, the committee on that, and um, that seemed to be a really good program. The texting individuals for court reminders um, was something that 
was helpful for um, reducing warrants. Um, a district court also provides texting for through the probation services for us. And Stephen might be able to fill us in a little bit more on that. Unfortunately, with COVID, some um, programs through that pretrial processes group didn't allow for in-person um, contacts. And, and so that was some of the issues. Is there anything else I'm missing on that, Stephen? Uh, well, the only thing I would add, Raylene, is that the primary focus of the pretrial processes work group, um, which is sort of a, a side effort with the uh, uh, the task force uh, supervised by the Superior Court, first Judge Garrett and now Judge Freeman, um, was to uh, consider and adopt and implement uh, a pretrial risk assessment instrument, which would try to, in a, in a database predictive way, determine who could be released safely for the community uh, and for the likelihood of returning to their case before their trial came up. So Vera very early on told us that 60% of the population in the jail was pre-trial. They hadn't been convicted of anything. They were presumed innocent. Essentially, bail had been placed on them as a condition of release and, and those people could not afford to meet even the, the uh, most minimal amounts of bail. So they sat in jail um, rather pointlessly, or at least potentially pointlessly, if, if they were not a risk to the community to be released. Um, there, there is a national movement toward that and a national uh, uh, conversation, debate, I'll say, going on about uh, risk assessments because one of the most predictive factors is a person's criminal history um, and uh, past practice of returning to court uh, voluntarily. Uh, a lot of that criminal history has some uh, racial overlay and, and practices of uh, particular jurisdictions, law enforcement practices, uh, not necessarily here, although perhaps some. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of debate over that. That work group spent a long time carefully studying uh, pretrial risk assessment instruments and came up with one that appears to be racially neutral um, and uh, has been validated in other jurisdictions. The problem is about the point that Superior Court was going to implement that, um, COVID hit, uh, jail booking restrictions were imposed, and trials were uh, postponed indefinitely. So. Um, it's been a rocky road in implementing that pretrial risk assessment tool, um, but it's sort of about to be picked up and utilized again by Superior Court judicial officers. Thank you, Stephen. And I see Darlene might be able to provide some more input on something I may have missed. Thank you, Raylene. I just wanted to add two things. One, um, the city of Bellingham and Whatcom County have both been given funding by their uh, councils for domestic violence treatment for those that are indigent. And so both the city of Bellingham and Whatcom County two years ago were, were given some funds. They were uh, cut down a little bit with uh, COVID-19 and the various programs that we had to limit due to costs, but they are both still going. Um, Bellingham, I know, received some more funding this year, and uh, we are seeing people that typically would not have been able to do treatment in those treatment programs. The one thing that I would say is the struggle has been that we've lost one of our local treatment providers, and so at this point, the challenge is getting more treatment providers. Doing domestic violence treatment alone is not something that people can generally make a living on. And so it generally has to be incorporated with other kinds of treatment or counseling to be able to work, be something that a person can sustain. And then the second thing that I wanted to let you know is that the city of Bellingham with their GPS bracelets can put an actual zone on a person so that if they are a DV offender, and let's say they can't go in uh, 
a thousand feet of a victim. If they get within about 1200 feet of that victim, an alarm will start going off. And they are told to call the bracelet company immediately. The closer they get, the louder the alarm will get. And so it will not only alert the victim, but alert everybody around that something is not right with the situation. And so that has been a really great tool for keeping people who really don't need to be incarcerated, but really need to stay away from a victim. And so that has been a tool that's worked really well for us. And so um, I just want to throw out there that while DV treatment is definitely a challenge. <laughs> um, we are seeing some positive steps and hopefully there'll be more of that in the future. The, one of the challenges is the, it's treatment of the offender. We have programs for victims uh, and um, it's just that offender treatment is very difficult. It requires a very fine set of skills and training. And uh, it is uh, certified by the state. So it has not been easy to find people who can and will do that kind of work. But to me, it seems like one of the most essential pieces in this puzzle is what, what are we trying to do? We're trying to divert people from jail and to prevent this kind of crime. So. It's terribly important. Arlene, I see a hand, um, Brel Froby. Sorry if I said your name wrong. Oh, no, that's great. Thank you. Um, would you be willing to share the name of the assessment tool that appears to not be racially biased and um, also any names of communities that, that have used it that, that seem to be happy with it? That That's question number one. And question number two is, you mentioned that, that, that the VERA project said that 60% or so of people are pretrial. And so I guess I'm wondering like what, um, how much, if, if this assessment tool was implemented, do you have a sense of a ballpark number of like how, how lower numbers would be in the jail? Like what, what kind of impact would that have on jail numbers? Uh, I'm, I'm glad to speak to that Raylene and Arlene, please limit my time to the extent you think is necessary. Um, this is a little bit of a complicated area, Brell. Um, the, the assessment tool that we settled on is called the Public Safety Assessment or the PSA. It was, it was piloted uh, and developed by a, a criminal justice uh, or a think tank, I guess I'll say, called the Arnold Foundation. Um, and first was uh, proprietary and piloted in Spokane and Yakima then they uh, made it public and, and so we had access to it. It's also being used, I believe in King County, uh, Pierce County and Clark County perhaps. Um, it's, and, and elsewhere across the country. Um, we have had the assistance from the state administrative office of the courts, a data scientist there, Dr. Andrew Peterson, who has helped us uh, for, first of all, he's helped all those jurisdictions uh, assess and adopt the PSA as a risk assessment tool. He's helped us looking at actual Whatcom County cases to validate that it's predictive for uh, ability to return to court later and uh, safety and not committing new violent crimes. Um, and uh, that assessment has looked promising for us. He'll post validate once we start building up usage in cases um, as well. So Dr. Peterson is a, a incredibly valuable donated resource to us locally. Um, so there have been there have been post implementation studies in Yakima uh, and elsewhere that show that uh, at the very least it does not worsen uh, racial inequities that have been built in the system. And in many cases, and I believe Yakima was one of those, uh, actually reduced racial inequities in the, in the proportion of uh, minorities who were incarcerated. So it, it's one that has a fair bit of study behind it. Uh, it has a wide acceptance. 
and to the extent we looked at it and then and then tried to fit it with local characteristics from from our actual uh, legal process uh, caseloads uh, historically and prospectively looks like it will work uh, on an equitable basis for Whatcom County as well. Thank you, Stephen. Michael Lilliquist. Yes, thank you for letting me ask a question. Um, my question has to do with the fact that you said that um, uh, service providers, um, counselors, therapists uh, mm -hmm. couldn't make a go as um, uh, treating domestic violence. I'm not sure if it was offenders or victims. I'm just wondering if the rate of compensation is the main issue and what thinking is there anywhere on increasing and improving the rate of compensation so that more providers will be able to work in the field? We definitely want to compensate um, the providers um, better than what they're currently at. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a struggle for defendants. Um, there is programs for victims. We have other issues for victims that will help with them, but it's the defendants that have mandates on getting um, provisions and, and treatment when needed. And um, there's a lot of different areas that we wanna look at. We wanna bring more people into our area. It's a nationwide issue. It's not just something here. It's also the Washington state has pretty stringent requirements for domestic violence treatment providers. And I see Dan Hamill and Darlene Peterson um, with their hands up and I'm sure that they can assist more in um, some of the areas that are a struggle for getting um, domestic violence treatment providers. So I'm gonna start with Dan because I saw his hand first and then go to Darlene. Okay, thanks for recognizing me. I definitely have opinions on this. This is a, um, an area that we have a, a deficit in and uh, Ms. King is absolutely correct. This is a nationwide issue. I think what we need to be doing is lobbying our, our uh, federal um, legislators um, to have the Medicaid reimbursement to be a steady 80% versus the 50%. Um, there's a temporary um, um, stay, I guess, on the 50%, and that, that makes it 80 uh, for the next year or two. We need to make that permanent. Um, navigating Medicaid reimbursement by providers is a nightmare. It's uh, not simply um, go going to an insurance company and doing a reimbursement. It's, it's much more complicated than that. So uh, providers need to have some kind of training or some kind of supports to, uh, to get those uh, reimbursements when it comes to uh, indigent offenders. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. <clears throat> Thank you, Darlene. Uh, when I mentioned um, that it, it's hard for somebody to make a go of it, I'm talking about those that are treating offenders. Um, typically in groups, if somebody's in a group session and they go once a month, the typical fee for that is somewhere between 15 and a week. And when you have a, let's just take a typical couple that splits up because there's domestic violence and there's a restraining order. One of them is generally couch surfing. And if they get $15, they're gonna buy gas or they're gonna buy food. They, they are not gonna have it to put towards treatment. And there's no way a court can force a private treatment provider to provide treatment without being funded. And so that has been the problem. When we started the programs to help those that were indigent get treatment, one of the things that um, Bruce Vengelup from District Court and he worked in conjunction, I believe with the health department, they came up with a pay scale that was much better, that was much higher than individual counselors were getting. But to be able to make that kind of business self-supporting, you, you have to have enough, not only you know to pay for your building, to pay for all your treatment. There are a lot of people out there that need domestic violence treatment, but it is not that many that are ordered to do treatment in relation to, let's say, chemical dependency. And so that's been the issue that we've seen so far. And right now we have two providers that are able to do domestic violence treatment that are using that grid that Raylene spoke of that really came into focus several years ago when they finally um, streamlined what 
domestic violence treatment had to have in it. And so that is what I was referring to. Thank you for that. Uh, Dan, you got your hand up again. Yeah, I just wanted to pipe up on, on this. So I think the, the SAC members that are here on this call today need to have access to the sequential intercept model and uh, should pay close attention to, there's three three levels of it. One where we have the, the things that we need and things are going pretty well. The other is, the, one of the other two is uh, deficits. We have some things, but we don't, we, don't, we don't have everything. And then the last layer is we don't have it at all. And so what I wanna caution members um, from doing is to um, provide a work product recommendation to Whatcom County Council that says we're going to put a bunch of money into behavioral health services and everything will be okay. Who are the providers that will provide those services? That is the animating issue that we keep running into over and over again, that we don't have the providers for whatever service that you think that we should be, that we should do. That's, that's the issue. And so um, if you can help us try to figure out who those providers are, compensate them well, get the workforce, the, the great, um, what was it, the, the, everyone walked off their jobs over the last two years during the pandemic, Th that happened in behavioral health as well. And those positions are very challenging to fill. Do you wanna go to work every day where your um, customers are in crisis? I mean, think about it. So we need to compensate those providers very well and encourage them to, to set up shop and in Bellingham and Whatcom County. Uh, absent that, we're, we're not gonna have solutions when it comes to uh, the behavioral health challenges that every community in uh, every, all 39 counties in Washington state face. So we let's get, let's figure that one out. Thank you, Dan, I appreciate that. Heather? Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I think this is a question for Darlene. I, it was sounding like you were talking about um, the compliance with treatment and that for um, middle of a for people who yeah. are struggling with substance use, uh, their treatment compliance might be higher because it's mandated. Was I understanding that right? But if it's for demet, I, I guess my, my long story short question is for Darlene, um, if we were mandating more treatment for domestic violence offenders, save the issue that there aren't a lot of resources for that, I get that, but are we also not mandating treatment enough or somehow making treatment part of the incarceration plan? It's definitely mandated when certain with certain offenses. And it's, I guess I'm not really explaining it well enough, when I say that um, with chemical dependency treatment, there are there's a greater number of people that are involved in chemical dependency treatment and domestic violence, it's a smaller subgroup. They may have chemical dependency issues as well, but it's a smaller subgroup. And then when we only have one or two providers in a county of our size, um, that has been an issue. And, getting them to be able to get into treatment, let alone pay for the treatment. So those are kind of the issues that we have. And, and courts do mandate it in, I know in district court, in uh, city courts, and I'm not real clear in superior court if they're mandating treatment or not, but I know it is in the courts of lower jurisdiction. Thank you, Darlene. And Heather, just to give you kind of an example, if I was to need drug and alcohol treatment, my insurance would cover that. Um, but if I needed domestic violence treatment, my insurance wouldn't cover it. So if I was to try to find a provider, um, the state requirements for a domestic violence treatment provider in Washington are very high. Um, and they're not always guaranteed payment because you don't have as many individuals and you don't necessarily have all of the components of substance abuse or mental health, which is covered by insurance. So a provider would be more apt to um, want to go into substance abuse and mental health because of compensation and considerations rather than domestic violence, which isn't a guarantee that they're going to have enough 
um, individuals or that they're actually going to get paid for it. So there's a there's a lot of different issues there, um, and the funding that that Darlene was talking about that the county and Bellingham have provided for treatment providers did get cut um, immensely when COVID hit and. And when I was talking to Jake Webush and um, Bruce Van Glup from Montcom County, the other issue is when somebody goes in, until they get their initial evaluation, you don't know how much treatment they have. So there was four phases that needed to be addressed. And so they had to allocate a certain amount of funds so that they would have all of the treatment required. And then once that evaluation was done, they could determine if they would use all of the funds that were allocated or just a portion of them and then the funds would be released for the next person on whatever was left. Um, I see hands from David Goldman and Ralph Ruby and I want to come back to you. I want to go over some of the other items on our list and so I'm going to write your names down so I don't forget you um, and then we can come back. I just want to try to make sure I get through a lot of the stuff that we've been working on. Um, and then um, I'll touch base with you again. So something Darlene brought up earlier was um, the use of jail alternatives and Bellingham was the first city to use friendship diversion services. Friendship diversion services are um, used now by Bellingham, Blaine, Everson, Sumas, uh, and Linden. Um, and they provide GPS and SCRAM monitoring for pretrial and post-conviction um, defendants. Um, pretrial is sometimes it's used for domestic violence, as Darlene was mentioning, and sometimes it's um, used for um, GPS monitoring for home detention, which would be post-conviction. And so a lot of times in our court in Blaine, which I work for, is um, we're using Post-conviction for GPS, the judge also puts SCRAM on SCRAM monitors, alcohol usage, as well as um, GPS. So an individual that might have been incarcerated in Whatcom County Jail now has bracelets on. Um, there, the judge, Our judge decided that he doesn't want people to drink while they're on home detention because you can't drink in jail, so you wouldn't be able to drink on home detention. So that's why the SCRAM bracelet is on. And then the GPS allows that individual to go to work, um, to go to school. Um, otherwise, they're supposed to stay home. So we're not going to McDonald's and we're not going to extracurricular events. We're basically um, detained at home. Um, but it allows people to still contribute to society or to get an education instead of being incarcerated. Um, that doesn't mean that everybody is eligible, but for most misdemeanor offenses, it is an option. Um, so friendship diversion services, like I said, it also is for pretrial monitoring. So an individual that has a, had a past DUI and is now charged with the DUI, the judge may have set a higher bail in um, the past saying that he wanted that individual to stay until we could resolve some of it because he felt that the individual was a safety risk to others. And now with that SCRAM unit, he can actually monitor alcohol usage while he's waiting a trial or sentencing um, for that charge. So that's uh, definitely been beneficial. And just looking at our statistics from Friendship Diversion Services for the city of Blaine, the um, people monitored by SCRAM had 99.4% sober days. So, so we do see a positive um, feedback from the companies that we're using for that. Um, we've had stories of individuals that have said, you know, that bracelet reminds me not to take a drink. Um, so we're seeing positive feedback from a lot of um, that. We also have LEAD, which is a law enforcement assisted diversion program, which you may or may not have heard of, but it's for people that have um, substance abuse or mental health issues low level crimes that can be diverted and um, maybe not go through the whole criminal uh, justice system um, if they're successful in the lead program. Um, we have mental health and drug court, which uh, Whatcom County and Bellingham Municipal Court for individuals need more a more focused program. 
Um, I want to allow Darlene to speak about re-entry and navigation. We have recently had some joint meetings um, with the Behavioral Health Committee on Competency and Restoration. So um, we we'll wanna make sure we touch base on that. And then COVID has impacted a lot of um, the areas that we have, including um, incarceration with the Whatcom County Jail. There has been restrictions on who can go into jail and who can't. And recently um, on February, I got a graph from Wendy Jones, so chief of Whatcom County Jail, saying who was in jail and, and who wasn't. And the number of pretrial felonies was 204 at that time. Um, pretrial misdemeanors was 14 and sentence misdemeanors on 20 or 23. And with those numbers on the misdemeanor charges, the ones that were in there on pretrial, most of those already were in there for felonies. Um, so we're not getting people into the jails because of some of the restrictions. Some of it's COVID, some of it's of the dilapidated facilities. So there's a lot of different reasons um, that people aren't there. So then you have frustration from the courts, um, from the, the judges, um, that we have individuals that we know that are supposed to come to court and they're not coming to court because they know nothing's gonna happen to them. Um, and so our warrants, which I would think would be going down or going up um, because people don't come to court. They're, um, they know that law enforcement have contacted individuals and they're basically getting laughed at because they know they can commit crimes without consequences, at least at this point in the game. So there's a lot of frustration there. I'm gonna turn it over to Arlene to discuss a little bit about re-entry and navigation. And I see hands from, I had David and I had Brel and I have Erica. Um, is there anything on the topics that I've discussed just recently that you have questions for or? Yes, okay, Erica. Thank you. I wanted to, um, and I, I'm gonna give you the disclaimer that our department is broad enough that I don't know every detail about everything. So it's possible that one of my coworkers knows this as well. But when you talked about the SCRAM device and especially among people who were charged with a DUI, I'm, um, I, wanna, I wanna explore a little bit about what, what opportunities there are for, um, for treatment because sobriety is not recovery and people may stay sober because of that bracelet while they're in that period. But we know that a lot of the DUIs reoffend, and because they're not getting into true recovery and have the support there. And I'm also a little bit concerned about folks maybe detoxing at home, not medically supervised if they really um, have a, a pretty profound addiction. So I'm just curious about how we're balancing um, the recovery needs with the, the criminal justice needs in this population in particular. So in the court system, you have pretrial and you have post-conviction. Um, and sometimes under pretrial, you have stipulated orders of continuance, diversion, or deferred prosecution. Those usually have requirements for treatment, uh, drug and alcohol treatment uh, may be mandated depending on um, the situation, the circumstances of the case. And it's a case-by-case -case basis, and it's dealt with between the judge, the prosecutor, and defense counsel. Um, they will make recommendations on how each case is best fit. So yes, the SCRAM device does not help everything. It does um, ease the minds of those that may have, have been sitting in jail for a longer period of time because of public safety. There's a 24 seven requirement um, or ignition interlock or sometimes both for somebody that has been convicted of a prior domestic or not domestic violence, prior DUI. Um, so if somebody's been convicted in the past, then there has to be some type of pretrial monitoring until the case is, uh, comes to a resolution. So the scram bracelet does assist with that. And financially, for some people that live in rural parts of Whatcom County, going into probation to um, give a urine sample isn't always conducive, but having a bracelet on that 
allows that to be monitored is beneficial for that. It does help people remind, remember, but there are other treatment programs that are sometimes required and necessary. Detox is sometimes done when the officer is arresting the individual. Sometimes they can't be brought directly to the jail and they have to go to the hospital first. Um, and sometimes they get to the jail and the jail recognizes issues and then makes sure that the hospital and medical staff are involved in that. Stephen? Thank you, Raylene. Um, thanks, Raylene. And just to follow up on what you were saying and, and to Erica's question, I just want to point out for SAC members that what you're hearing is many, many different jurisdictions from municipal courts to district court to superior court, all of which handle cases in their own ways, in a different seriousness of cases, different rules, uh, different laws. Um, and uh, there's pretrial and post-trial uh, policy goals, uh, as well as, as legal requirements. So the complexity of this is, is quite daunting in a way. And I, and I just want you, as you listen to some of these descriptions, to realize that you may be hearing something that's effective and available for Darlene and Bellingham Municipal Court that doesn't exist yet for Whatcom County Superior Court. And so, to, to try to make recommendations that create a, a, a sort of unbroken continuum of services. It's across jurisdictions. It's from early in the sequential intercept model to post-conviction. Um, it's a really complex picture that we're asking you to handle and to understand and to make recommendations from. But keep, keep, the, keep the checkerboard in mind as, as you hear some of these bits of information. Thank you. Brell, Froby? Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, yeah, my question is around, I think it's around the um, monitoring devices that you were mentioning. Um, so, you know, it um, seems like since COVID hit, um, I, at, when, when COVID was really hitting, I was tracking jail numbers and they seem to have gone down dramatically. I haven't been recently looking at the numbers, so it was really helpful. Thank you, Raylene, for sharing those recent numbers around uh, jail numbers. So I'm wondering if if um, that dramatic increase that happened, is that because of like a, a greater utilization of these monitoring things? And um, it, are, are things that, that got implemented during COVID as just like a practical need to keep jail numbers down? Are those things that could be continued or are they being continued to be implemented post COVID um, as just like uh, tools to reduce incarceration? I know for the cities of Blaine, Everson, and Sumas, and I, I think I can speak for Darlene that they will continue to use it. It's definitely a lesser cost um, for these tools to be used, and they were being done prior to COVID um, as well as post COVID. Some of the cities have been brought this on um, after COVID came in. I know Lyndon. I can't give you the exact number, but it wasn't that long ago that they actually implemented this. Ferndale has discussed it, but I don't believe that they've jumped on the bandwagon yet. Um, you know, there's there's definitely concerns that you don't want to give people a false sensitive of security that bracelets are going to solve everything because they don't. Um, they, they definitely assist, um, but you're still going to have people that are going to violate no contact orders, whether they have a bracelet on or a piece of paper, um, but it does help. Um, and we also have seen a definite need for it for um, cases like shoplifting and trespass, and these people continue to get picked up, but they still need that. But a registered sex offender may not meet those requirements. So certain laws and certain statutes prohibit us from using um, electronic home detention devices um, for certain crimes. If somebody has active warrants, we're not necessarily going to use a home detention device for it to be cut off because they're being booked in another jurisdiction. Um, so then we have to start all over. So, um, and the judge has defendants that we've got notes on that has, have an individual has tampered with or um, destroyed a device um, when being used. So it doesn't necessarily work for all of that. And for your question on the number of offenders in jail, you know, COVID has had such a dramatic impact on who can be booked and who can't. You can't put somebody in the work center like you would before because it's an open area. Um, and so 
there's restrictions on who can be there, who can be transported, who can't be transported. You've got a high level of offenders that haven't been able to go to Western state and get competency evals or treatment or restoration because COVID has impacted those as well. So you have a high level of individuals that are awaiting trials that trials haven't been able to happen um, because, because of COVID. So you've got people that are sitting there on high level offenses that are dangerous to the public that may or may not have mental health issues. Um, and so that's where you're seeing the felonies are predominantly the cases that are in jail and not the misdemeanor crimes. It doesn't mean that those misdemeanor crimes shouldn't be in jail. I, I recently had somebody not come to jail that was charged with his fourth DUI and no ignition interlock in court. Um, those are safety concerns. You know, if, if you have that many DUIs and you're still driving around and you're not coming to court because you know that you're not going to get booked because you haven't committed a crime that's at a high level um, is, is definitely frustrating for law enforcement as well as the judges and the courts that are working with them. I hope that answered some of your questions. Yeah, thank you. And just a quick follow up. Do, are you aware of any courts that use the monitoring programs for nonviolent felonies? Um, I, I can't speak on, on felony um, use okay. for the, that at this time. Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Arlene, do you want to uh, touch on reentry and navigation? And take yourself off mute, please. Thank you. You're still on mute, Arlene. If you just hold your space down, space bar down, you should be able to uh, speak. You either have to hold it down or you have to click the mute button on the left of your screen. Okay, I, I should just hold it. Okay, got it, got it. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna go over uh, the reentry program prior uh, to COVID because COVID disrupted uh, much of what was available um, for a period, uh, for quite a long period of time. But the reentry essentials um, start with the need for jobs. In order for somebody to not come back around and go into crime, it's important for them to be able to find some way to support themselves. And so the programs we've had, um, that, uh, one was presented to us by Goodwill. Goodwill was in charge of um, re-entry program prior to COVID. And um, what they reported to us is that there are companies that are willing to hire people who have been incarcerated. And so that was actually very hopeful. In addition, they were providing training for the work setting. So some of that had to do with communication, the structure of the work situation, uh, it was very detailed. What will be needed is a very robust program for jobs and job training in the jail. The next most important um, issue was education. So I think we have David Goldman at this meeting, but David came in and presented um, many, uh, much of what the needs were. And he talked about the fact that um, there's a very high percentage of illiteracy uh, in people who are in jail, almost 50%. This is very high. So, so uh, tutoring is important. Uh, many of the people in jail wanted to get their GEDs and they were able to do that. However, 
the big problem that we are continuously talking about here is uh, waiting lists for service. So that means when we reestablish these programs, they need to be uh, doubled and tripled sometimes in order to have people not wait months to start their training programs. It's important for people to have ongoing emotional stability. And in the past, uh, counseling has not been available in the jails, ongoing counseling. That is essential. Part of the reason is uh, we've been told that there's no space in the jail for counselors to come and work with people. So this takes us back to the jail issue, which is that all the things that I'm talking about uh, have to do with space too. Staffing and space. We have to have enough rooms, we have to have staff, okay? Um, sobriety services go along with mental health services. Um, those are also essential. I have asked uh, if we could have 12-step uh, meetings, for example, for people who want to continue on with support, and there was no room. Okay, so that's unacceptable. It needs to... <laughs> it needs to be possible for people because many, many uh, people in jail are, have co-occurring disorders. They are uh, addicted and they have mental illness problems. In addition, uh, we've been told that uh, some of the, there's a very high percentage of uh, severe mental illness in people who were in the jail without treatment. They are getting medicines and they are getting um, methadone, for example, and suboxone, but treatment is essential, cannot be left out. Everybody needs medical help, so it's very important for people who have illnesses or, or chronic conditions that they be treated in an ongoing way. There are some people who, when they leave, uh, will have no housing and they are homeless. Um, many cannot be uh, uh, accepted at base camp and that has to do with their offenses. This is also true for rentals, but there are, it's, so it's essential to, to provide housing because if we want people to stay stable and sober, they have to have a place to live. It's true that the state is sending more funding for housing, so there will be more funding available, but it isn't sufficient. So I've talked about the space in the jail and the fact that um, there was not sufficient counseling available or counselors available. I've been told that uh, for quite a while, there were two counselors that did the work of five individuals. Okay. So that gives you a sense that the staffing needs to be doubled and tripled. For a year, they didn't have a reentry specialist. Um, substance abuse is predominant. It's definitely, and it's not safe in the jail. It's not safe for staff, and it's not safe for offenders. In addition, the mentally ill are often isolated because uh, they can't share rooms with other people and they're violent occasionally. So there's no question in my mind that the jail conditions are horrendous. 
and that the jail itself is an essential change in this process. As far as navigators are concerned, I think that that's uh, necessary also uh, because this is a population of people who fall through the cracks and need extra special, extra special support. And that's one of the things that keeps them from cycling over and over and over again. That's the thing we wanna stop and we, want, we don't want them coming back to jail. So um, these are some of the steps needed. Any questions? Elaine, I just like to touch on the jail navigation and re-entry that you were mentioning. Uh, there is an, a new jail navigator that I think Dan might be um, talking about, and we're going to be discussing uh, re-entry and navigation at our next joint meeting with legal and justice and behavioral health. And a lot of the navigation and re-entry has focused on individuals with mental health and behavioral health. But where we are lacking in some of that is those that don't necessarily have those issues. Um, Darlene touched on it earlier and somebody that might be charged with a domestic violence charge first time. They have now um, been handed a no contact order. Yes, you can leave, but you can't go back home. Um, so now you are homeless and your spouse now needs to figure out how to afford to take care of the kids in the home. And they might be petitioning in court to remove that no contact order, even though their safety might be at risk, but because they don't know how to financially support that family. So the victim's advocates do a fabulous job in trying to assist to these individuals, but they also, um, you know, usually have some care and consideration for that individual that was just booked into jail and now can't come home, now may have lost their job because they were incarcerated. We don't want them turning to substance abuse or alcohol or having mental health issues. So we, we don't want to leave anybody out. We want to make sure that everybody's getting the adequate assistance when they walk out of the jail to know where their court dates are, what they need to do, what they can and can't do. And defense counsels are fabulous. And the ones that I've worked with are great at helping people, but they're not social workers and that's not their job. And unfortunately, I think there's too much of, well, that's not my job when somebody walks out of the jail. And so we need to have somebody that this is your person. They're gonna walk you through things. Yeah. Uh, that would be they're, they're there for anything that's needed. Whatever the person needs, if they need reminders about their meds, if they need reminders about um, their appointments, their uh, seeing the doctor, seeing the psychiatrist, um, getting to their meetings, it doesn't. The point is, it doesn't matter. They can, and these people can be um, uh, master's degrees, or they can be peer counselors as well. Thank and you. I can see that we're going to be increasing the number of navigators all throughout the social service system. This is very much needed and a wonderful addition, I think. Dan? Yeah, I, I agree with everything that um, Arlene and Raylene just brought up. Um, one of the major missing um, components is housing. We, that comes up all, all the time uh, and pretty much in every discussion. And if a person's released to the street, what do you think their chances of being successful and not, not recidivizing are, I mean, it's, or, or, or using uh, substance use uh, or, or having a substance use disorder issue. And we have the most potent and um, horrible drugs on the street right now, right now, uh, fentanyl, car fentanyl, um, P2P meth, which is uh, horrible. And so, and, and folks can easily slip in, into, those, um, into those drugs. Um, Arlene's right, we need to have some kind of um, robust navigation system and we need to incentivize people to use it. So um, how do we get them to, uh, to do a warm handoff to someone that's gonna help them, um, whether it's via the LEAD program or GRACE or some kind of navigator system that we haven't thought of yet. I think for, for SAC members, that absolutely has to be on the table when it comes to, we're talking about community safety, um, preventing um, the person from committing again and protecting uh, victims. 
those are the major food groups that we are, that are under the microscope right now. So how do we do that? How does navigation happen? Who pays for it? Um, how do people get stay connected when their when their next address doesn't have a number on it? It's the the doorway down the street. How do how does that happen? <clears throat> and so, you know, you've bitten off um, a lot here bit by being a member of this uh, stakeholder advisory group. Those are the things that we have to deal with. Those are the things that the task force deals with all the time. And those are the things that you're now committed to, to doing, to, coming, to come up with some solution, um, basically by this time next year to get in front of voters to say, hey, we think we figured this out. We think that we might have some answers here. And it's a, it's a continuum. We're not building just a box to put people in. We're not building a monument to, to history. We're building the future of what it means to keep our community safe and to help people stay out of the system. So I just wanna urge you all to, to really think deeply about um, what that looks like upon, upon re-entry from the jail back into society. This community has always, well, it's for the 33 years that I've lived here, has faltered when it comes to um, successfully helping people so that they don't commit again and they, that they are successful, that they get a job. How do you do that when the average length of stay is less than two weeks in the jail? Can you can you get teach someone how to how to read during that time, or can you treat a mental health illness? How does it work with Western Western State when it comes to um, comp competency restoration? Th those are huge challenges, and so um, I don't know. I'll, I'll leave it at that. But that's where I'm at. I'm I'm in a place of frustration and of wanting to do way more than what we're we're what we can do, and that's. I'll just stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Bro? Yeah, I, thank you, Dan. Um, I, Dan, you said something earlier that, that I just wanted to re reiterate about how helpful it would be for SAC members to get, I forget what it's called, but whatever document that shows like what's being done, what we need more of and what's not being done. Just because to your point, Dan, I think like, there, I imagine a lot of work has already been done on the task force around recommendations and um, it'd be great for this, for the SAC to get a really clear picture of like, uh, especially on the pieces of what, what we need more of and, and what hasn't been done so that we could make, you know, what you're talking about in a year's time from now. Um, yeah, because I feel like there's a lot of work that already has been done that I'm just trying to get caught up to speed on. Thanks. It's the sequ you. sequential intercept model. I don't work for the county, so I I feel a little bit uh, shy about asking county staff to do anything. So maybe if a county council person can ask staff to send that out, I'd, I'd feel more comfortable. I think Jill is actually um, on this meeting. Uh... Well, I'd like to answer that question actually. Thanks. Um, right now, the, the Behavioral Health Work Group is uh, doing their work for our June meeting. They're doing a, a behavioral health gap analysis and inventory of services, and they are updating that sequential intercept model. So I don't know at what point during their work they'll have that completed where it would be available. Maybe Perry, you could you could uh, give us a, just an inkling of what you think that timeline might be. Certainly. Thank you, Barry. <clears throat> Perry Maury. I'm the human services supervisor with the health department. And we have met as a small group of knowledgeable individuals just about behavioral health services and, and housing services and pulled some of the subject matter experts in, uh, many of them connected to uh, the health department, but um, also outside the health department to just get the primary pieces on the piece of paper to update this sequential intercept model. We should um, be able to really complete that a preliminary update and review, I would suspect within the next two weeks, I'm probably putting myself out there just a little bit in terms of uh, that date, but I think that it will be ready enough to have others take a look at it if there's something missing. Um, that was our next step within uh, the gap analysis group was to reach out to specific community members, including uh, the stakeholder advisory committee um, and others, um, the tribes, uh, NAMI, um, uh, several other groups that have been identified that we really want to get that input from to have a finished uh, document. Hope that so helps. It might be fair to say then in a month for sure we can we can have that vetted and done. I, I'm guessing. Does that sound reasonable, Barry? I feel comfortable with that, Barry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I see a question from Harriet. Hi, thanks. Um, 
Um, I remember seeing the intercept model once or twice. And my question is, um, does it also provide information about the funding sources for each of the different kinds of services? Um, and if it doesn't, in my brain, I'm envisioning a matrix of um, type of service, maybe by category of prevention, intervention, post-discharge, post I'm, I'm not a health person, um, <laughs> post-release, et cetera, but, but also who provides it, how many um, slots or beds or, you know, what the capacity is, and also what is the funding so that we understand um, whether there's private insurance, Medicaid, no funding, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know if it's the matrix is the um, intercept model is that complex, but that's what I think would be really helpful. Barry and then Dan. Oh, having trouble with my buttons. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Harriet. I, I agree. And I think, you know, I've talked to Jill Nixon about what we want to see this thing ultimately look like in the next, you know, after it's updated. And what we want to do is to have, have it on our website and have live links to all the program's details, each program's detail that's listed on this on the sequential intercept model. So that's the goal. Once we get it updated, we would take a look at, at really kind of making it a useful tool for the community so they can see funding sources, they can see how programs develop, the capacities of those programs, as you mentioned. So that's the goal. Thank you, Barry. Dan? Yeah, Harriet, that's a really good point. Um, that the sequential intercept model is not that sophisticated as of yet, but it does need to have those funding sources tied into it. Also, I would, I would add to that um, what the sustainability on those funding sources looks like, um, opportunities for new funds. Uh, for example, last year, city uh, and county council both passed um, House Bill 1590 uh, dollars that added uh, money for housing and for mental health services. It'd be nice to see how those funds are being used. Um, we also have ARPA dollars that are, um, that are attached to both the city and the county. Uh, we could have potential um, opportunities there to um, invest in new pilot opportunities as long as there's sustainability uh, incorporated into it. But I think that you're right. You, I think that it, it, it is complex, um, but it's um, it, 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 we have to have that level of detail in order to understand how are we going to continue to do this and where are missed opportunities and how can we fund those. So I, I, I totally agree with you. Good point. Thank you, Dan. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everybody that assisted in this meeting, um, Stephen and Dan and Darlene and Arlene and Barry. Um, I probably missed somebody, but um, you're all, uh, I appreciate, oh, and Perry, I appreciate your input on this because obviously I don't always remember everything and I need assistance. I also wanted to thank all the members here from the stakeholders committee for taking your time and it's a daunting task that you have decided to take on. So I great, greatly appreciate it. It is two o'clock. Um, if anybody has any further questions, I believe Kathy Helka can um, route them through um, Jill or you can send an email to me if you have any questions. I can make sure that Jill gets that out to you or Arlene. Um, and if I don't have the answer, I'd be happy to direct you to somebody that might have the correct answers. So thank you so much. It is 2.05 and I think we're supposed to be done it too. So I appreciate it. Freeling, sorry, can I just add, if there are any questions, uh, members can email sac at co.wacom.wa.us. We'll make sure it gets to the right person and we'll also kind of catalog it and make sure it gets posted as well so everybody can see. Thank you, Jackie. I was just going to mention that. I was just going to ask Marty or you to cue that. So thank you. Yes, no problem. Thank you. And Barry, does that wrap things up? I think it does. Again, uh, it's just great to see everybody again today. And thanks for being here. And uh, we have another one of these tomorrow. Dan, I think your committee, our subcommittee is going to be doing your behavioral health, health uh, at four o'clock, right? So we'll probably see you all tomorrow at four o'clock and uh, again on Thursday at 1.30. We're adjourned. Thanks, folks. <laughs>